Chapter 32, Sunday, September 22nd through Thursday, September 26th, 1776. Our distresses were very great indeed before, but this disaster has increased them tenfold. Many hundreds of families have lost their all and are reduced from a state of affluence to the lowest ebb of want and wretchedness, destitute of shelter, food, or clothing. New York Mercury Newspaper Near 500 homes were destroyed that night, plus shops, churches, and stables. Thousands of people were homeless without even a change of underclothes or clean stockings. Many did not eat meat for weeks on account of the death smell that poisoned the air. The job of finding bodies was so gruesome it caused grown men to scream out loud. They buried the dead quickly. Folks said the fire started in a low groggery near the Whitehall Slip. From there, it burned uptown, pushed by a strong wind, devouring Bridge Street, Dock, Stone, Marketfield, and Beaver. Then it ran up both sides of Broadway. Almost every building from Broadway to the edge of the North River was in ruins, all the way up to the open field below King's College. They called it the Burned Over District. God's judgment on the British, whispered the Patriots. Rebel sabotage, shouted the Loyalists. Most figured the Americans wanted New York burned to the ground to leave the British without shelter. While the fires still raged, groups of soldiers searched for arsonists. One man, found with rosin and brimstone-tipped slivers of wood in his pocket, was tossed into a burning cobbler shop. Another was quickly executed with a bayonet through the chest. Half a dozen people were hung while the fires still raged, one from the signpost of a tavern. Another was hung from his heels and had his throat slashed. The day after the fire, they captured a school teacher, name of Nathan Hale, up island near the Dove Tavern. He admitted he was a spy, but said he did not set the fire. There was no trial, nor proof of his guilt. They put a rope around his neck and hung him high. Folks talked about a pretty speech he gave afore they kicked the stool away from his feet. He said he was sorry that he could die only one time for his country. The lobsterbacks laughed at that. I coughed up mouthfuls of soot for days. My eyes felt crusted with embers. No matter how much I rubbed them or rinsed them with clean water, they remained swole up, red, and hard to see out of. I was lucky. I was not kilt nor burnt. I had not been twisted. I had not even twisted an ankle running from the flames. All I lost in the confusion was Ruth's doll. All I had lost was everything. My bees a-swarmed back into my brain pan. They hummed loud, so I need not ponder on the baby doll. The burned-over district looked like the inside of me. It was hard to tell where one stopped and the other started. I feared my wits had been melted by the flames, twisted and charred. Dr. Dastuge came to examine Lady Seymour. The left side of her body had gone to sleep and would not wake up. The doctor said it was an apoplexy, brought on by the fire. He bled her twice and prescribed Meredith's drops to cleanse her blood. Master Lockton insisted his aunt should recover in the bedchamber he shared with his wife. Madam was not pleased with the arrangement, but said nothing for a change. She visited the ruins of the Seymour house daily, waiting for them to cool enough so that she could poke through the ash with a hoe in search of coin or melted silver. Lady Seymour called me to her bedside when she regained her senses. She tried to thank me, but the affliction pulled at her mouth and made it hard to figure her words. I gave her the portrait of the yellow-haired man and the letters that I had stuffed in my pocket as we fled. She studied them close with her good eye. Then she sobbed, and both her eyes overran with tears. Madam bade me leave the room. By the third day after the fire, the Lockton house was packed tighter than a barrel of salt cod and smelled worse. We had been invaded again. Many of the rebel houses that were occupied by the British Army had burned to the ground. Soldiers found themselves as homeless as regular folk. So their commanders ordered that anyone with an undamaged home share it with the men. We wound up with 11 fellows from Kent, sleeping three to a bedchamber and using the second floor drawing room as their common area for dining and conversating. 
the master and madam moved their bedchamber to the downstairs front parlor and gave the library over to Colonel Hawkins, a high-ranking officer whose favor Lockton sought. The cellar was turned into a barracks for five soldiers who had their wives with them. This was the Lord's blessing on me because the women were used to cooking and cleaning for, and cleaning for their men's regiment. The new boss lady in the kitchen was named Sarah, a black-haired gal with a baby in her belly. She was not a friendly sort, none of them were, but she did not call me names nor seem inclined to hand out beatings. I did miss Becky Berry more than I thought possible. It was, an, it was odd sleeping in the cellar with strangers. They sure did snore, the women as bad as the men. Their bodies gave off noxious odors, too, gases so strong they made my eyes water. The night of the first frost, I woke up to a soldier pulling off my blanket. I lay in the dark, fist, fists clenched and teeth sharp, thinking he meant to do me harm. He did not. He was simply cold and in need of, and in need of another layer of cloth. Next morning, Sarah agreed I could move my pallet up to the kitchen hearth. It was lonely sleeping without that fool doll.